Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Milkshakes Markets Madness. My name is John Kutsmita, and every week I'm joined by Brent Johnson, the man behind the dollar milkshake theory. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what that is, please visit milkshakespod.com. There's more information there. Also on our YouTube channel at Milkshakes Pod, you'll see at the top there's a playlist called Start Here. There's a number of videos there that I think will help you better understand the dollar milkshake theory the global financial system overall, and how the dollar as reserve currency plays into that system. Now, every week we bring various financial market commentary, but this week we focused more on the madness piece. Now, the reason that that word is in our name is partly because of this is oftentimes a maddening world, but Brent, as someone who has strong influence and oftentimes is at the center of various financial conversations on Twitter, oftentimes gets some really unusual or unique reactions to his posts. And many times when you look at those reactions, they don't seem very thought out. They feel a bit uh, emotional. And that maddening piece was always something that we enjoy talking about personally before we decided to start to do this show. Now, this episode focuses a little bit more on that. We start with some recent interaction interactions Brent has had on Twitter, and then we move into some of the things that have been happening in the markets lately that we feel kind of, we're all really interconnected. We really enjoyed this conversation. It was a bit more topical in terms of stuff that's been going on. It wasn't so heavily focused on financial markets, but we don't think this was just empty banter. I think there is some interesting correlations between some of the stuff that was going on politically, um, financially, and some various business mergers and or announcements that were all very relevant. So I think you'll enjoy this conversation. Welcome back again to Milkshakes Markets Madness. I drink your milkshake. Brent, it's good to have you back one on one. We had a special guest last week with Hugh Henry. But um, now that we're back to our one on one, I feel like there's a lot of topics that we, we need to catch up on, especially this past week. And I want to drive us right into it. Um, we were just talking offline, you know, the show Milkshakes Markets Madness, it's been a lot of uh, market stuff. And because of that, there's been a lot of coverage on the dollar milkshake theory, Euro dollar markets. I feel like we've, until we got to spend an hour with you last week, I, I feel like we've been neglecting the madness. And this week, actually just today, um, kind of highlighting some of the stuff that was going on this week, you made a comment about crypto. Do you want to kind of highlight that tweet? And I'm definitely going to show it, but I, I want to talk a little bit about the crypto battle that's going on and kind of the, the madness of, of Twitter lately. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> I, I, it just it just kills me. And, and do I do it on purpose? Yes, I do it on purpose. But I also do it to kind of get a conversation going. And I try to do it to kind of lighten the mood a little bit and have a little bit of fun, right? I mean, this is kind of a stressful job. And to me, going on Twitter and kind of mixing it up and making some jokes, it's part of the stress relief. So I basically, you know, today, what happened was over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of news about, uh, you know, the SEC suing Binance and then Gary Gensler, you know, making comments that, you know, some of these, a lot of these crypto currencies need to go away. And so that was in the news. And then also, you know, oil price has been down. Um, and then today, a potential deal with the U.S. and Iran that would let them sell more oil kind of hit the news. And yesterday, I think they sold some more oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And so oil's been under pressure. And so I went on Twitter and I basically said, you know, how it started, how it's going. And basically, you know, 12 or 18 months ago, the the ha the, the how it started was that you know, there is nothing the U.S. can do to stop Bitcoin or crypto and there and the U.S. government can't print energy. Now, this was when Bitcoin was around 50,000 or 60,000 and oil was at, you know, 130 and, you know, nat gas was at seven or eight bucks. And since that time, you know, crypto has been cut in half or Bitcoin has been cut in half and a lot of the others are down a lot more than that. And, you know, by using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and you know, leaning on, you know, some allies, the U S has been able to get more oil available than many people thought would be available. And so oil prices are down significantly. Oil prices are down 50% and nat gas down, are down a lot more than that. And so my point was how it's going now is that 
you know, you know how it started, how it's going. Well, the point I was trying to make is, yes, of course, the U.S. government cannot literally print energy, but they do have a few tricks up their sleeve that they can influence markets. So when oil's at 130 and you think it's going to 300, like Cuppy, and I, you know, I have great respect for Cuppy, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with Cuppy long term. But my point was, is when people say there is nothing the government can do, there is nothing the central banks can do, there is nothing that can stop this train. I think every, and whenever you hear the word never, you should take a step back and pause because never is a long time and impossible is really, really hard, you know? And so, and there are a lot of things that can go against you no matter. So no matter how solid your thesis is or what your belief is, never say never. And so anyway, so I threw this out there as kind of a little lighthearted way to, 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 to talk about these two topics and you, you, you can imagine how uh, the responses were. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> Brent. You definitely have a way of, of triggering not just people, but people who have a, um, a variety of personality quirks. And um, you know, it's going back to this: never say never. We hear it all the time. We hear nevers all the time. We hear the S word: should they should do this or this should happen. Um, you know, a big one that we harp on is you know, inevitable isn't the same as imminent. And that's something, at least for me, that I've learned is the more aha the narrative feels, the more like you can get behind the story because it just makes sense, the more likely yep. it's not going to be true. And I, for the whole the whole time of last year when the, the energy story was going on, it just, in my gut, it, you start, I feel like over time you get punched in the face enough time in the financial markets, you start to kind of have that like internal, like this sounds too easy, right? Like, of course, right. Oil is going to go to 300 because there's a war and, you, you know, one thing after another, you have all these arguments. You're like, it's probably why it's not going to do that. Right. Right. No. And that's, you know, was I was I, you know, picking at people a little bit? Probably. But was I was I trying to have a little bit of fun? Yeah, too. But I'm also like trying to like, you know, put a lesson out there for people to, you know, and the reality is, is if two or three people kind of pick up on it, like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Then, you know, perhaps it's a, perhaps it's worth it. So speaking of the madness and some of the influence you have, at least over um, perking engagement from individual or unique individuals, there was a couple times that you did this <laughs> this week. Um, one was you you kind of retweeted a post and you you asked, "Is this true?" Literally a straight question, no emphasis either way. Um, and the response was just like, again, we don't need to go so down that rabbit hole. But what I found was funny is that. You have the ability to ask a question and get instant feedback. And some of it is just emotional feedback, but oftentimes it's very useful feedback. And yeah, in, in the context of the crypto tweet we were just talking about, that's the, the feedback you're looking for is really to, you know, kind of stir things up and have some fun, you know, take some of the tension off your day. But recently, and I don't think it was this week, maybe it was last week, you had a question about Argentina because you're not only curious from a dollar milkshake standpoint, but you have a potential trip coming up. Do you wanna share a little bit about what that tweet was and, and how useful, at least at this time, the madness of the crowd actually was? Yeah, I mean, that's a great example. And, and I'll say, you know, I'm very lucky. I have a lot of people that, for whatever reason, have decided to follow me, and they're from all over the world. And so I can actually get fantastic information by asking a question on Twitter. Um, maybe it works better for me than it does for every, everybody else. Uh, but you know, if, if I put a question on Twitter, I will often get many responses. And a lot, a lot of times there will be links to either newspaper articles or reports that I would never find on my own or websites or resources. And so it's a fantastic resource for me. Um, and so the Argentina is a perfect example. Now I happen to know a few Argentinians and I probably could have just called them myself and I could have probably gone on Google and figured this all out myself. But basically I wanted to ask about how hard it was to exchange um, dollars for pesos. And, and this sounds like a stupid question, but the reason it's not is the official exchange rate uh, for dollars of peso is 250. Um, but the, but the, but the, on the street rate is 490. So it's almost double, right? And so if you show up with physical dollars in Argentina, um, you know, you can exchange them on the street and get 490 rather than 250. If you walk into a bank, 
And so my question was, how easy is it to do that? I knew that it was possible. I have a client who was there a couple of months ago and told me that, you know, told me about it. Um, so I had sent him a text a few minutes before I put it on Twitter. And then I asked, just asked on Twitter and, you know, immediately I got, uh, several responses on Twitter. I got several direct messages with resources, ways to do it, you know, people to talk to places to go and do it. I mean, it was fantastic. And, and, and I, you know, I went back to a couple of them and said, Hey, what if I do this? And if I do that, and you know, within 30 minutes, I probably knew more about how to exchange dollars for, you know, uh, pesos and back and forth and the, 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 the inside tricks to get a little bit better rate than if I had spent three hours trying to figure it out myself. So, uh, to me, Twitter is a fantastic resource and, and the, the, the reach that you can get and the local knowledge. I mean, I had three people from Buenos Aires reach out to me and saying, Hey, this is how you do it. This is what I would recommend you do. If you have any more questions, reach out to me. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. So speaking of Argentina, I'm not sure if you caught the headline uh, regarding Lionel Messi. Were you aware of the big announcement that he made? Yeah, I, I, I did see it. And I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I mean, I think I was very surprised by it. I mean, to me, that that's a huge thing for, for, for Miami to get, I mean, arguably the greatest player ever. Um, I knew that he, and I'd kind of been following it because I know he, I knew he was trying to get potentially go back to Barcelona. And I knew that, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Christian Ronaldo had gone to a Saudi Arabian club earlier this year or last year. And so they were trying very hard to get Messi, and were offering him all kinds of money. And I know he was also trying to go back to Barcelona. And I knew that Miami was kind of in the mix, but I kind of thought that was maybe one or two years down the road when he was more, you know, ready to kind of go into the twilight of his career or whatever. Uh, but when I saw the news come across, I was I was shocked to be honest. Um, it's a huge it's a huge deal for Miami. Um, I think Miami's only been in the league for three or four years or something like that. Um, they're relatively new. And uh, I'm sure Beckham le leaned on uh, Messi pretty hard to, to, to get him to come over. But uh, can you imagine the number of Messi jerseys they're going to sell in Miami to all the, you know, the Argentinians? I mean, my God. Well, it's a huge it's a huge move, a huge, a huge decision for MLS across the board. I mean, I yep. the, Americans just don't care about soccer. We just don't pay yeah. attention. And I think a big reason for that is the, the lack of star power. Um, I think there's tons of other reasons, but there's there's really no brand connectivity when you have people like Le LeBron in the NBA. Um, you have endless stars and, and um, kind of faces of, of the league for the NFL that people can kind of get behind and cheer for. I mean, this is this is almost critical to the ongoing growth of, of the MLS. Now, I have no idea what uh, relevance or truth there is to it, but I believe there's something um, in the contract or Messi has some kind of deal with Apple. Did you read that at all? Yeah, so uh, I did. And I, I uh, the way I understand it is he is going to get a percentage. Of, it's, it's both Apple and he's also going to get a percent of the merchandise or something that uh, so the jerseys he sells and stuff, he's going to get a percent of that. Uh, but then he's also going to get a percent, you know, based on the number of people that sign up to stream I, I, whatever it is over Apple, um, which is a big deal, right? And so, you know, potentially this ends up being a bigger payday than just, you know, whatever salary he would have gotten going elsewhere. And I think the other thing that's really interesting about it, and I think probably weighed heavily into his decision to go to Miami, is the fact that the World Cup is going to be in North America next time, right? So whether or not soccer grows in the United States, Otherwise, regardless of whether soccer would have otherwise grown over the next four years, I think there will be a natural growth of soccer in the United States over the next four years just because the World Cup's going to be there, right? There'll be increased events and more promotions and, you know, people from all over the world will be coming to North America and, you know, doing stuff with soccer in North America. And so I have no doubt that he will be, you know, even though he's Argentinian, will be playing for the Argentinian team if he plays again. Um, I have no doubt he will be heavily uh, part of that whole North American soccer extravaganza or promotion, however you want to say that. And perhaps there's something in there, too, that we don't know about and we'll find about, about later. But, 
you know, not only that, but the other thing is that, you know, Argentina is in the same time zone as Miami, right? Or and so you know, playing in Europe, uh, it was probably harder for his you know fans to be able to watch it as much. Um, but to have you know, I mean, everybody in South America is crazy about soccer, right? And now to have him playing kind of in the same time zone, or or at least a much closer time zone, um, I, I, I can't. I mean, I bet that Miami's booming anyway, but I, I literally think it's, it's silly to say the one guy could influence tourism in, in, in Miami. But I think I think Latin Americans and Argentinians are going to flock to Miami to, to watch these MLS games. Well, I, I mean, the going back to the fact that it's not yet a big deal in the United States versus if you try to go to one of these games, whether it's you know, somewhere when he's playing for Barcelona or yeah. there's some other type of event where there's a player you really like and you're trying to go see them play in Argentina or Buenos Aires, like, good luck. Where the chance yeah, right. that you're going to be able to get a good seat, a good experience at a, at a fair price to see um, Lionel Messi in in Miami is, for a little while is, is going to be um, attainable. So I think, I think you're right. I think there's going to be a big draw where Miami kind of becomes the port of tourism and then people are like, hey, yep. I'm now here in the United States, like where else can I go? Um, yep. It's it's gonna be interesting and I think you're seeing more and more, I wanna say crossover, but it, it, I don't know the best way to describe it where you have, you know, there's musicians who are now getting, are negotiating contracts where they're, they're getting access to these additional revenue streams. You have actors say like a Ryan Reynolds who are becoming like wild yeah. and multi, you know, billionaire entrepreneurs. And so this makes sense. Like, do you just get paid to play soccer or do you now take your, your brand authority and become part of the business ecosystem? Because I've always tried to bring this light to people particularly when I lived in um, Hawaii, everyone would be so obsessed with becoming a pro surfer. And I'd be like, you don't really want to be a pro surfer. You, you actually want to own the surf company, right? And it's it's the same thing here. Like, do you really want to be the athlete or do you want to participate in the ownership of the team? And so I think this is, you're starting to kind of see the the realization, the aha moment where like, you can pay me all you want, Saudi Arabia, but I'm just your your pawn. Now I'm I'm an owner. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's a guy named Roger Mitchell. Um, I don't know if you know him or not. You might know who he is. He does a podcast with Grant Williams, uh, a sports podcast, and he's been heavily in involved in business sports in, in Europe, you know, for different uh, soccer clubs. And uh, he was involved in the music industry at one point. So he's just a really interesting guy. And he's been he's been writing about this and about how um, not only how, uh, you know, the whole business of sports is changing, but also that, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the Middle East is getting more involved with their energy money. Right. And so, you know, the, the fact that, that, that Lionel Messi almost went to Saudi Arabia, um, but ultimately went to Miami, there's no doubt in my mind that, that, you know, the the opportunity for Messi to kind of become more of a ambassador slash business person who's sharing in the equity of the sport as opposed to just being a player who got a incredibly high salary um, kind of goes into this thinking and so I, I just think it's a, I just think it's a fascinating story um, you know I've always I'm, I've never been a huge soccer fan other than the big matches just because of the environment because um, I didn't grow up playing soccer but. Um, you know, there's no doubt that it's the number one sport in the world. And so for Messi, the number one player in the sport, playing the number one in the number one sport in the world to come to the United States, it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's it's um, has me thinking at what point do you eventually have to start shorting Florida because it's clearly the highest migration or one of the highest migration points right now. Housing markets going crazy. You've got a potential presidential candidate in the mix. Uh, Miami Heat's in the NBA Finals. Florida Panthers are in the Stanley Cup. Now they they swing Messi uh, Messi coming to Miami. Yeah. So you know you can only be red hot for so long. So I think maybe at some point it's a good point. There's a That's a very good giant point. earthquake and it breaks off into the ocean. Who knows? But you got to start. Uh, this goes back to what we were saying earlier. You know, when the when the momentum is there and the storyline is there, eventually you got to start thinking maybe against the crowd. So we'll see. Well, along, see along how, those lines, maybe it's just a correction, though. You know, that's that's the other thing is like 
you can believe in the long-term thesis, but also understand that in the short term, it might go against you, right? We've talked about that a few times as well. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying necessarily to go out and short Florida yet, but but you, you make a very good point. You know, when you're kind of at the top, you kind of got to be ready for a pullback. Yeah, fair enough. Well, if there is um, a pullback anywhere, and while we're on the sports topic, we had some interesting news, which is involving Florida to some extent because it's a popular golf destination, but we had this um, huh. strange merger between the PGA and LIV. Fascinating. To me, this is the most fascinating story going on right now. And I know a lot of people are there saying golf, it's such a stupid sport. Why would you? But I, first of all, I love golf. I think golf is the greatest sport ever invented. Um, I just love everything about it and and I love watching it and I love the I love the tradition of it. And this has just completely upended the tradition of it. But I actually think it's for the good in a way. And what I mean by that is I think that the PGA tour had gotten very stale and it had gotten very uh, I don't know, uh, lazy for lack of a better word, and that they basically had a monopoly on the sport. And the executives there were making all kinds of money. Uh, they didn't really have to do anything. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the thing is, is if you're going to grow a sport or even just maintain that level, you need to have the young people that are coming up be excited about it. And you know, no young kids were excited about golf. You know, we would get jokes about, oh, it's a boomer sport, right? Oh, okay, boomer, you're going to go watch golf. You know, it's so boring. And and I think that anytime competition is brought into something, it's good. It, it, it demands innovation. It makes you react. It makes you um, come up with something new. And when Liv came on board uh, a year ago or two years ago, whenever it was, um, I thought it was great because it's. It, I thought it was going to mix things up a little bit. And, and in many ways, uh, Phil Mickelson, who kind of led the charge on this, and a couple of the other players who left for very large sums of money were were really drugged through the Coles on this saying, you know, they were, they were taking blood money. Um, you know, they were selling out, they were going against tradition. They weren't uh, appreciative of all the things that, you know, the Jack Nicholas and the Arnold Palmers had done. And my take on it was, I believe me, I get the, 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 the part of it of, you know, taking the Saudi Arabian money. But, but the reality is, is that Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest and longest allies of the United States. And it in the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia influences every part of American life because it goes right to the heart of the economy. So if you want to be upset about, you know, the relationship that, that, that Saudi Arabia is now going to have to the golf industry, that's fine. But you also need to be upset about the, the food that you put in your refrigerator and the cars that you drive and the clothes that you put on your back every morning. I mean, if you really get down to it at the country level, you know, dirty deeds go on. And again, I, you know, I talk about this a lot in my thesis. I don't necessarily like it, but that's the real world, right? And so the idea that, um, that these people, these golfers should not have taken the money, um, to me always kind of felt wrong. Um, but the big thing was the hypocrisy of the PGA tour because they came out and said, oh, this is awful. I mean, they just basically belittled these guys, said they were bad for the sport, basically because they weren't in on the money. But then as soon as they potentially get a piece of the money, now everything's fine. And this is going to be great for the sport. And this is a way to grow the sport. And the thing is, is I actually do agree that it is a way to grow the sport. And I do actually think in some ways it'll be good for the sport, but the hypocrisy is, is it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen. It, it, it's, it's bigger than any politician's hypocrisy and that, and that's saying something. So it, to me, it's just going to be fascinating to see how this all plays out. Um, but you know, because it has everything in it, it's, it's sports, it's competition, it's money, it's geopolitics, it's morality, it's religion. I mean, <laughs> who would have thought that all of that would be in, in the middle of golf? Uh, you know, the most boring and state sport on the planet now all of a sudden has all those things kind of mixing it up in there. So to me, it's just a fascinating story. Well, I think you you encompass the whole arc of the story very, very well. Um, I don't find any of any of it fascinating um, <laughs> from the context of golf. 
because I just yeah, but, may, maybe you know maybe if it was UFC and there's actually like you know something enough. exciting to watch. I'm on the other side of that. I, I think you know you might be able to get me out there to to chase a ball for nine holes, but I, watching it and I, it's just not my thing. And and some of the yeah, political yeah. aspects that you you highlighted of this merger, it does still feel a bit like a bunch of rich old white men. Um, you know, it totally is that. The, yeah. It getting, totally getting, is that. Getting cranky about, you know, not getting their fair share and then basically yeah. just putting their foot in their mouth after trying to torch these people's reputation yeah. with a bunch of political slander. Totally agree. And then, so do, does the golf community care? We'll find out. Do people who don't know enough about golf now who eventually get interested maybe because this thing draws some new eyes? Do they care about the story that led up to the merger? We'll, we'll find out. But I think um, from a political standpoint, I think you made some really good points there. Uh, I just don't find golf that interesting. Um, but, but speaking of golf and speaking of Florida and potentially speaking of peak Florida, um, just, I guess, sem somewhat breaking news here while we're chatting. Trump was just indicted for his uh, classified doc Shock situation. Of shocking. Shocking. This now, really just not happened? Just happened, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so what's interesting about this to me, and I think this is going to intertwine into another thing that we want to talk about here is um, the article that I read. So it came through an Apple news alert, which, uh, news alert, which they, they tend to annoy me because it's Apple news is so left leaning. Um, and so everything that they feed you is, is very framed from that, that lens. Um, we're all very much in need of a more neutral uh, view on things like where has journalism uh, gone. It, it's always wrapped around various biases, whether it's left or right. So this is an article from Washington Post. Obviously, they just go on to slander Trump as much as they can about this whole thing and, and make it into this like, this is the most dramatic, worst thing that's ever happened. But not yeah. once in that entire bit do they mention the fact that, you know, Biden had classified docs in his garage and basically a shoebox. So it, it yeah, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I, I found the, the story no. kind of timely and hypocritical. Well, it, it, it's both and it, it's all of it. You know, it's, I, I think you said it very well. It, it's, it's completely hypocritical. Is it appropriate? Maybe, you know, I, I don't have the details on what documents he had. And if he, you know, if he had the nuclear code sitting out in the corner of his office in Mar-a-Lago, then there's probably some, that, that's probably not a good thing. Right. But again, you know, how many classified documents were found at Biden's, uh, you know, his office in Philadelphia at the, at the university, and then his garage and well, Delaware and his vacation home and wherever it was. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing is they just, they, when I say they, it's like, you know, traditional media or the powers that be, however you want to describe that, they just can't stand that Trump became president. They just can't handle it essentially. And they will do anything, um, you know, to keep him out. And, you know, you can make an argument that maybe maybe he should be out. Maybe he shouldn't be in there. But again, they're not doing themselves any favor by selective prosecution and and the end of hypocrisy. You know, and in many ways, this is going to backfire on the prosecutors. You know, Trump himself said, I could walk out onto Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and my supporters would never leave me. Now, He's right. Now, you don't have to like that, but he's right. And and the fact that the media and the the Democrats or the people in charge, have, again, however you want to describe that, the fact that they won't quit talking about him and won't keep quitting going after him, they're playing right into Trump's hands. I mean, this help, this, this does not hurt Trump. They may think it does. It may galvanize their side. But as far as bringing anybody from the middle to their side, it doesn't help. And it certainly doesn't help bring anybody that, that used to support Trump to their side. Well, neither did the the town hall that CNN put together, it, it, you know, a network that's just struggling to get eyeballs. So they go so far out on the extreme to bring the man that they hate on. They, they try to in various ways make a fool of him on the show. He ends up just making a fool of the host. Um, yep. They alienate their side. Everyone 
in, in that liberal media world was so upset with CNN and, and their viewers were so upset because they were hoping to dunk on Trump and they were unsuccessful. Yet when you talk about that middle, he probably did a somewhat decent job at that point of bringing some you know people from the center closer to his side because he he handled himself better than than one would expect him to in that environment, especially since he hasn't really been um, in that type of uh, limelight in a while. Now, speaking well, it's, it's of gonna, these, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, before we leave it, let me say this. This is where I think it gets really interesting because everything we've seen Trump in so far is that he's in his environment. Like if you put Trump in, in front of a camera, he is better in front of a camera than anybody else. If you put him in a debate situation, he's better than anybody else. If you put him in a, it, it doesn't matter whether he's smart or well-spoken, he knows how to get his point across and he knows how to use the camera to his advantage. I don't know whether that translates the same way in a courtroom. So if he, if this indictment does actually lead to some kind of a courtroom situation, which again, I, I don't know any of the details yet. I don't know whether that bravado and that, you know, however you showmanship will translate the same way. Maybe it will hurt him. Maybe it will help him. Maybe it will hurt him. I don't know. But I do know that so far he's, he is for the most part, even, even in defeat, he has kind of been in, in his own arena. And I'm not sure that will be the case in this next phase. We'll see. There's a, there's a comedian, Shane Gillis. Um, he was on SNL for a short period of time before he got fired. That's kind of like his calling card. But um, I think he's really funny. He did, you know, a lot of these up and coming comics now with, you know, the YouTubes and the social medias can kind of grow their own platform and then put out these like, it doesn't need to be a Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle Netflix sponsored special. They can kind of throw up some some lighting and, and record their own special. And he has one of those and it's, I think it's really funny, but he has a whole segment on Trump. He does a great Trump impersonation, but he talks about how, um, you know, he's got a, he's from Western Pennsylvania. So it's, it's very like old school Republican, uh, conservative. And his his dad's a you know Trump dad and 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 he was talking about how before the debates nobody liked Trump and then he went up into these on these debates and basically oh. just crushed people playing almost like a um, school playground style of debating yeah. just like taking cheap shots at people and he's yeah. a comedian so the, so he tells the story brilliantly with a whole bunch of bits I'll never like I'll never watch a debate ever again. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, just a regular debate now? After we witnessed, like, we witnessed the GOAT. <laughs> Undefeated in debates. <laughs> and he never said a fact. <laughs> you know how impressive that is? He was funny and he argued like a fifth grader. He was unstoppable. <laughs> People would try to hit him with statistics and facts. He would just go, wrong. <laughs> like, oh, fuck, dude. How was no one prepared for this? Go back and watch those debates. You forget how, how, good, how electric that it was. Don't tell your friends in Austin, they'll be mad. Just get a six pack, toss on a Trump highlight video on YouTube. It's a good night, dude. Why, I went back, I watched his first debate. That's like my favorite one. At the time, Trump was polling at like less than 1%. Like he was, no one liked him. If you guys like him now, you didn't back then. And I know that, because my dad, I watched my dad. My dad at the time, he would like, anytime Trump even came on TV, my dad would be like, get this joker. Get him off the fucking screen. And then now my dad's like, guys can't go to the Capitol? <laughs> He's like, guys can't have fun anymore? <laughs> He's like, and it was because of the debates. That's what did it, dude. That's how we got Trump, these debates. And the first one is the best one. So it's a Republican primary. Everyone's up on stage, and they're all still doing their political. So like the first couple guys that talk are like, I'm from Kentucky and I love education. And the crowd's like, nice. We didn't know what was coming. And then the next guy's like, I'm from Georgia and I love religion. And the crowd's like, pretty good. This is a good one. This is a heated debate. And then it finally got to Trump's turn to talk and he was just like, Rand Paul is ugly. And the whole crowd was like, oh. We didn't know you could do that in this. You can just do that as your thing. 
And Rand Paul was like, all right, everybody, settle down. We're trying to have a debate here. And the whole crowd was like, shut the up, Rand Paul. <laughs> Ugly <laughs> 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 And we just kept throwing dorks up on stage to make them debate Trump. And it was not fair. It was mean for us to have done that to people. These guys were in politics their whole lives. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're making that point, right? He's, he knows how to handle that situation better than most. He's proven that. He, he won you know, the Oval Office by those techniques. We'll, we'll see what happens in the courtroom. Uh, I think he's as arrogant and perhaps narcissistic as he is in a lot of situations. I don't think he's dumb enough to cause um, a stir with people who have his fate in their hands. So I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll play nice in the courtroom. But look, we've, we've kind of been on this um, interesting, like, hey, this is what's been going on in the world uh, this past week type of episode. We haven't really talked about markets. I don't think we're actually going to get to it, but we've kind of been on a, a journey that's led us to what I think would be a good closing uh, topic or discussion, which is um, speaking of these media conglomerates and speaking of some of this middle of the road media that I think a lot of people are searching for. Uh, Tucker Carlson left Fox News. It was a well-known announcement. Um, there was talk about him doing something on Twitter. Last week or a couple days ago, he released his first episode of T uh, Tucker on Twitter. Um, it was, I think, a a brilliant presentation, very well spoken, very well crafted message about the hypocrisies of these narratives. He focused heavily on Ukraine and kind of the falsehoods that we get fed by the mainstream media. And just today he released episode two and he talks heavily about taboos and some of the things where, you know, the messaging around white supremacy and then there's this pedophilia issue that, you know, is, is getting ignored and he talks about the, the Instagram algorithms. So I felt like, you know, the, the middle of the road voice that we've been waiting for is slowly finding its way to these social media networks and these social media platforms are becoming the network through which any of us can have a voice. And in his case, he's kind of breaking the record books. His, his first video that he posted, I think in a day had um, 90 million views. That same yeah. length video, if he posted it or you know did that on, on the primetime Fox hour, maybe would have got 2 million. Uh, the replacements yep. for him only got one and a half million. And the one he dropped this morning, I had only looked 15 minutes after had posted and he already had a half a million views. So it's um, an interesting to have that centric voice Finally, I think coming from a media personality celebrity like Tucker, but it's also interesting to see it coming to the social media platforms. Well, not only that, it's interesting to see the legacy media just lose their mind over it. And when I say legacy media, I'm not just talking about CNN and ABC and NBC and the Today Show and the Washington Post and the New York Times. I'm talking about Fox News. Fox News is losing their mind over the fact that he's doing it as well. They're suing him, telling him he shouldn't be able to do it, right? But I mean, it's it. when you have both sides going after you, it's pretty clear you're doing something right and, and that you're stirring things up. And it shows that it's not just one side or the other side that's afraid. They're both sides are afraid because legacy distribution systems are getting disintermediated by platforms like Twitter and other social media sites. And probably the most interesting thing that I have seen on this related to this, and I God, I hope to God it happens. I don't think it will, but I hope to God it does, is every time something like this has happened on Twitter, Elon, again, regardless of what you think of Elon, just think about what he's saying here. He has said, it would be great if people from the other side would come on Twitter and do something similar, right? And if, is he pumping his site? Of course he is. Is he trying to get rich off of? Of course he is. But isn't that what you would want? Wouldn't you want somebody from the other side to have the same opportunity as Tucker Carlson or somebody else? And if, if you're hosting a platform that is supposed to hear all sides, wouldn't you want the owner of the site to say that? And so it, I think if I, I think somebody from the other side should do it. now. Will it come across as well? Will, will, will they be as well-spoken and as well-accepted as Tucker? I don't know. I mean, Tucker was the most popular person when he was in a traditional 
uh, environment? Would he, would he still be the most popular in this new environment? I don't know. But, but you know, the, the fact is, is this is not an exclusionary thing that only Tucker gets this opportunity. You know, Elon has made it available to the other sides as well. Um, you know, DeSantis did his, uh, you know, coming out party or whatever, or his launch party on Twitter. And Elon said there, it would be great if candidates from the other side launched on Twitter as well. Now, again, is this self-serving? Of course it's self-serving, but it's not exclusionary. So I, I, it's going to be fat. Dude, the next three, four years are going to be fascinating. <laughs> I can't, um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Oberman. So that's the first one that comes to my mind. Now, the, the difference here is when you look at what Tucker is doing, he's taking these like very adult, um, almost professional debate style uh, approaches. He's, he's like making his like opening remarks, supporting it with points. It's very colorful. It's also thoughtful. You almost don't know where he's going with it. And then he kind of like makes this yep. um, subtle point by bringing it all together as he takes you on this kind of conversation. Now, I don't know, I mentioned Oberman only because he's the first one that comes to my mind as someone who has like a big primetime audience, but he's just a whiny baby in my opinion. Like there's, um, yep. I don't think that's like the, to have someone more on the liberal side have a voice that can compete with Tucker. I think the point here that we've kind of been making in some of the last few minutes is that the center is is tired of being misrepresented. We're every, we're every four years yes. we're forced to pick someone on the extreme. And I, I'm, I feel in my heart that most of the, the country is moderate or in the middle somewhere. Um, totally. And so we, we want someone like a, a, a Tucker, if you're slightly right leaning, highlighting the things that are concerned to you, but doing it in an intelligent way that's not alienating someone who's intelligent, but maybe more left leaning. Instead, everything is just someone screaming from a soapbox <laughs> to the, yeah. and we're all tired of it. So I don't, I don't think that's who should be Tucker's counterpart, but I feel like someone who draws attention, but can speak more eloquently and without this hyperbole and nonsense, I, I would really love it because um, you don't know the story until you hear someone else's story. And I, I don't, I, as someone who's a little more conservative leaning, mainly from a financial or fiscal standpoint, um, I think socially I'm, I'm more liberal, but I, I struggle to find intelligent conversations coming from that camp. Yeah. Let's hope, uh, let's hope some cooler heads prevail and some, you know, moderate voices are heard because, you know, the extremes are extreme and, they're pitting us against each other, right? And that, that typically doesn't lead to good endings. No, it doesn't. Well, speaking of endings, this was a fun conversation. We, um, earlier in the, in the journey of the Milkshakes Markets Madness show, would um, sprinkle in some sports talk and we get a little pushback like, oh, enough with the sports talk, just get to markets. Um, and so on this one, I feel like we ducked and weaved through the topics with purpose, you know, we are, we're kind of talking about the market impact, some business strategy, why some of these things are happening. There's a lot of political influence, like with the, with the PGA tour decision. So I think these were relevant, um, sports conversations and off financial market topic conversations. So hopefully people got value from that. If you want to learn more, visit our website at milkshakespod.com. You can find Brent on Twitter at Santiago, Santiago, AU fund. You can find me at John Katsmita. And uh, you can find us every week on YouTube at Milkshakes Pod. So we appreciate you joining us. Brent, any last words? No, we got the Fed meeting next week. I'll go on record saying I still think they're going to raise. That's not the expectation. I think they're going to raise. Uh, it's either going to be a dovish raise or a hawkish pause. Okay, well, we'll try to sneak on before that to uh, highlight that point and talk a little bit about the market activity that we skipped this week. Until then, everybody have a good weekend and we look forward to seeing you next week. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.